How's it going, everyone? This episode of the podcast is sponsored by 101 Hemp, the makers of premium, full-spectrum, raw CBD oil products. Now, I know a lot of us are more than a little stressed out over what's happening in the world today, and anything that helps us cope with that stress a little easier is always welcome. That's why I take the Chill-X raw CBD oil from 101 Hemp, because along with the calming properties of that raw CBD, that CBDA, it's also blended with the highest quality of organic passion flower that accentuates that chill factor and helps me with overall relaxation. Now you can get that in their award-winning blueberry flavor along with their new tropical bliss, just to name a few. So go over to 101hemp.org, order yourself some premium, full-spectrum, raw CBD oil products, and don't forget to use coupon code IMGS25 to get 25% off of that order. All right, now let's start the show. Brothers and sisters, welcome back. This is the In My Grow Show. I'm your host, Alex. I want to thank you once again for taking the time to hang out. I truly do appreciate that. Now, a little later, um, I am going to talk to Kevin Jodry. He was really nice enough to take some time and come on the show, man. I had a really awesome conversation with him, and I'm going to play that for you a little later. But first, let's talk about a couple of other things. Now, I hope your gardens are looking good. Mine's doing okay. You know, it's the end, the end of August. You know, so everything's starting to flower, so that's cool. I am going to put out a fresh batch of green lacewing larvae here in a little bit. Um, and that's because, you know, I, I, I've started seeing some moth flight, which means those moths are laying eggs out on my canopy, out in the rest of my vegetable garden as well. So, yeah, I'm going to get those green lace wings out. Um, let me grab those real quick. I'll show you what I picked up from Rincon Vitova. So this is the card they come on, and they've already hatched. I've had them for a couple of days. Let me see if you can see anything moving around on them. They're everywhere all over the back of them. And these little circles here, these little cutouts, they're actually hooks. They're perforated. And I can hook them on my plants. Look, you can have a better look on the back. They're crawling around. I don't know, maybe you can't see them. But anyways, yeah, those are going to help me deal with um, any of the pests that I have that are trying to invade my canopy, my, my cannabis. Because, yeah, the last thing I want in harvest time, because harvest is in October uh, um, outdoors out here in California. And actually, in most of America, harvest time is October. So last thing I want is any kind of surprise pests that have taken over my cannabis. Because it sucks to find your bud full of bugs, at least bad bugs. So these are going to go out into the garden um, just after I get off of here. All right, I'm going to push pause real quick, put these back away. So don't forget, if you're growing outdoors, uh, you know, get your predators in. It's, it's going to be time. Something else I wanted to talk about was, so last night we went to go see Fitz and the Tantrums. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. They're, they're a really good pop band. You know, they got some really catchy tunes, man. Um, anyways, uh, out here... They're doing what's called concerts in your car. It's basically like a drive-in, but um, for concerts. Luckily, the band, Fits and the Tantrums, were actually on stage. They were live. It wasn't like some kind of weird simulcast TV thing. And that was pretty cool, man. It, it was good to get out. It was good to, to get with other people and see some live music. Um, they put on a really good show. You know, the energy... I mean, yeah, the energy was a little different than an actual live show inside a venue. But again, man, it, it's, it's what we've got to do. It's, you know, it's what the artists have to do to actually, you know, entertain us and make a living. So good on them. Um, and I'm sure it'll get better the more of these kind of things that go on, you know, more of these kind of events, these concerts in your cars go on. Again, I, I liked, mostly I like the social aspect of it. You know, I mean, was the sound quality there and everything else? Well, you know, it's, it was like being an out. It was like being at an outside concert. So, if you get a chance, if Fitz and the Tantrums come through your town and you guys are doing something like that, concerts in your car, yeah, go check it out, man. It's a good time, a lot of fun. Now, the last thing I wanted to bring up before we move along is somebody asked me why I don't do more Zoom interviews for the show, and mostly the reason is because I don't like the sound quality that I get from Zoom. I would rather just record a regular phone interview and then 
edit it together for the video show. Because again, the Zoom, I mean, the audio, there's always a, a stutter, this, like this digital stutter, or, or there's this lag time also with the video itself. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan. So I'd rather take the time and just get a better song quality by recording the, by recording the phone interview than, yeah, just getting a halfway good sound and a halfway good video. So, I don't know. I mean, it may take a little more time on my end, but I'd prefer that. It's a better sound, and I get more qual- and I get more control of that sound. So that's basically why you're not really going to see me doing a lot of Zoom interviews. I mean, unless I have more than two people on the show, like a panel, or you know, which is is going to happen here in the next few weeks. That's probably the only time I'm going to use a Zoom. All right, now let's get to the strain of the week, and today I'm going to talk about the Wi-Fi OG also known as the White Fire OG. It is a cross between the Fire OG and another strain called the White, which is also known as Triangle. And it had this, this like rosy, floral, earthy, you know, gassy kind of flavor and taste to it, which I really enjoyed. And the high was like super energizing to me, you know, it didn't really like bring down my motivation at all, you know, which was really awesome and it really helped me focus. More than other strains. Other strains will get me pretty high and then I can't focus on anything. This um, Wi-Fi OG was really good at just helping me stay focused. It was really good for those creative things I had to do, you know. Um, I liked it. It was, it was a great high. Now, I found out on the internet that uh, the Wi-Fi OG is typically recommended for anxiety, depression, cancer, or probably the associated pain with cancer, and maybe the symptoms too. I'm not real sure. Glaucoma, pain, and appetite loss and it was put together by Glasshouse Farms. Here, let me take out a little bit of this. So, and I really liked it. it. It had some really great color to it. It had this nice, you know, color and it's a little frosty. Can you see that? Can you focus in on that? Right there. Right there. Like that? That right there. That. It came out. Ooh, yeah. It does smell like... A little bit smells like dirty socks a little bit, too. Anyways. Um, really liked it. The only problem I did have with it, it it's a big jar for just an eighth uh, so yeah i think the packaging was a bit much but other than that good on you glass house great flower i really enjoyed the smoke if you see it out there the wi-fi og uh pick it up it you're really gonna like it all right now let's move on to the report from the cannabis front line and the first article is going to come from normal that is normal.org go over there get informed and then become a member And it is entitled, Lawmakers Prepare for a Historic Floor Vote on the Moore Act. Starts off, House lawmakers are preparing for a September floor vote on legislation, the Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment and Expungement Act, a.k.a. the Moore Act, to remove marijuana from the Federal Controlled Substance Act. The forthcoming vote could mark the first time since the passage of the Controlled Substance Act of 1970, which places the cannabis in the same category as heroin as a Schedule One controlled substance. So it is a beautiful sunny day out here in California, and there's a regional airport close by to where I live. And um, there's a couple, there's a few people who have these vintage World War II airplanes, and they take them out. And uh, (laughs) they just make it a little hard to record outside sometimes. All right, but getting back to the Moore Act, let's see, it says here, it is a bar, it is a bipartisan legislation that removes marijuana from the Controlled Substance Act, thus decriminalizing the substance at the federal level and enabling states to set their own policies. It also says the act would make several other important changes. For example, it permits physicians affiliated with the Veterans Administration to make medical marijuana recommendations to qualifying veterans who reside in legal states. And it incentivizes states to move ahead with expungement policies that will end the stigma and lost opportunities suffered by those with past low-level cannabis convictions. If approved, the Moore Act also allows Small Business Administration to support entrepreneurs and businesses as they seek to gain a foothold in the emerging industry. So that's pretty cool. Apparently, they're supposed to vote on this like September 3rd or something like that. I think it's like, I don't know, Thursday next week, Friday, I'm not sure. But yeah, that'd be cool, man. Um, 
because we need a change. We need something that some kind of movement in cannabis. And you know what? It could be that they're pushing the vote also because, you know, the uh, vice presidential pick for Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, is one of the sponsors. I think she's actually the one who put this forward. So, yeah, I mean, hopefully they do get it. Hopefully they do vote on it. All right. Now, the next headline comes out of the marijuana moment. And it's entitled, Sheriff Files Lawsuit to Keep Medical Marijuana Off of Nebraska's Ballot. And this was put together by Tom Engel. And it starts off, After failing to convince Nebraska Secretary of State to keep a medical marijuana initiative off the state's ballot, a local police official is now going to court to try to prevent voters from getting a chance to decide on the measure. Lancaster County Sheriff Terry Wagner filed the case on Friday just one day after Secretary of State Bob... Evnen rejected his argument that the ballot proposal causes confusion, creates doubt about what will be authorized after the election, and violates the state's single subject rule for initiatives. That filing was made by a law firm that refused to disclose the sheriff as its client. Ooh, you know what? I think uh, the good people of Lancaster County, if uh, the sheriff, Sheriff Wagner, if he's voted in, you guys should vote him out. You know, um, I don't know if they're voting for him this year, but if they're voting for him next year, get together, vote that guy out for campaigning against the legalized cannabis in Nebraska. That bastard. All right, it continues. Now, the top county cop has revealed himself in a new lawsuit filing, and the state Supreme Court will take up the dispute and arguments with arguments expected on Thursday, a decision will need to be made in the case by September 11th, which is the deadline to certify items for the November ballot. So I truly do hope the court shoots this guy down. This, um, the, what, what's his, who, who's the sheriff? Sheriff Terry? Sheriff Wagner. Sheriff Terry Wagner. Vote that dude out. So, yeah, wow. Um, you know what? Good on you, all those cannabis warriors out in Nebraska for keeping up the fight to get the cannabis measure on the ballot in November. Hopefully the judges, you know, rule on our side, on the cannabis side. I say our side because I'm with you guys. Um, hopefully, you know, the judge rules in favor of cannabis and not in favor of Mr. Terry Wagner, the sheriff. Again, vote that guy out. Get together, vote that guy out. Get a campaign, vote that guy out for that reason. Um, he, he, he doesn't want you to make money. He doesn't want to create jobs because he doesn't like cannabis. And cannabis can do all those things. Especially if your state's economies are suffering the way a lot of states' economies are suffering right now because of the quarantine. Cannabis is a good way to create jobs and to, you know, get some of that money funneled into the state coffers. And that, brothers and sisters, was the report from the Cannabis Frontline. As always, there are links in the show notes so you can look them up and read these articles at your leisure. All right, now, so as I said earlier, I'm going to play for you a conversation that I recorded with Kevin Jodry. The guy's a legend in the cannabis industry, man. He, he's been in it a long time. He's really smart. I, I really enjoyed talking to him. I was really just amazed at how generous he was with his time and, and like all of his information. You know, he was really honest about things. Uh, if you don't know who he is, do yourself a favor. Look up Kevin Jodry. You can go to kevinjodry.com and just listen to all of his different things he talks about, whether it's growing or the cannabis industry. But look him up, man, for sure. Uh, so, yeah, you know, um, hang tight. And I'm going to play a little bit of music, and then I'm going to put that conversation on for you. Brothers and sisters, check it out. I'm really excited to talk with my next guest. Um, he is someone that is a legend in the cannabis industry. And I mean, he was in the weed game before it was even legal, you know, and he's one of the few people who've been able to actually make that transition from the black market to the legal industry. And I think that gives him a really unique perspective on the cannabis industry today. You know, I mean, he, he's more than a cannabis farmer. He's, you know, more than a cannabis businessman. He, I mean, he's the one and only Kevin Jodry. Kevin, brother, welcome to the show, man. I appreciate you taking the time. All right, uh, man. Thanks so much for the, for the warm welcome, and uh, great to be here. Yeah, for sure, man. You know, that's, uh, 
That's all true and well earned, brother. Um, hey, so real quick, man, while I've got you while I've got you on the show, I wanted to ask you something aside from the other things I want to ask you. And that's um so back in 08, 09, when the recession hit, you know, and we saw the weed prices kind of drop because everybody was growing at home now. Do you see that same thing happening because of the quarantine this time, because of the COVID thing? A little different. The thing in 208 was, you know, you, you had, because uh, 210 was Prop 19 in California, and that really brought the, that really brought people out of the woodwork, too. But um, they had the, the first financial collapse. What you had was a thriving medical industry. So we had a really, really robust, in, you know, California, we had a really robust medical industry. And, and that meant that you had tremendous number of storefronts to be able to buy and sell products. And so the problem is, is that with where we are now, you know, unless you're a licensed operator, you can't get into any of the legal storefronts. And they've been doing a really, really aggressive job going after the unlicensed. And so it, it removes the opportunity. And, the, and, and even though, like, I own a store, the, the idea that you're having to be financially snuffed out, it, it just doesn't sit well with me. I don't really, I, I've never seen the unlicensed versus the license that's not that's not our our fight our fight is uh, uh purely uh, poor bureaucratic decisions regulatory problems that that's where the real beef with legal is is that it, it's not that your neighbor who's moving some some herb into the system on tax is is destroying your potential it's really that the regulatory scheme is so messed up so with covid what you had was an actual increase in consumption because everybody was at home and then the people that were at home that were on unemployment received a, a, a $2,400 a month stipend on top of their typical unemployment. And so I think, you know, what would that come out to, you know, some ungodly number? I think that's what really drove the, the numbers back up is that there was a, 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 an amount of money to consume because you were basically quarantined at home. And the question is, does the market continue to hold that consumptive quantity with the reduction in the monies because they haven't straightened the economy out so people are still having to struggle and they're not given that extra cash on the unemployment and then they threw that 1200 COVID bonus to pretty much you know everyone and that was a one-shot deal but when you put twelve hundred dollars into the system multiplied by you know 200 million 300 million people whatever the total number of recipients were it creates a massive financial push on something and cannabis really was something that people turn to when life is hard you know cannabis is one of those things where when you're happy smoking makes you happier and when you're sad smoking makes you happier so we have a little bit different circumstance in the 208 you know hey real quick so did you let your farm grow feral this year and was that no no i did that two years ago oh okay two years ago i I let i let it sit empty two years ago and was that because of regulation it was because of regulations. It, you know what happened was they hit me. There, 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 there was a couple years in a row, right, where I had started. I put the farm in, and then I put down. You know, I go put two thousand plants out, and then I get hit up by my permit specialist saying, "Hey, they've uh, they've uh, changed some of the regulations on sediment leaving farms." And I said, "Well, we're up to code. You know, we followed the current code that we had this built. That's how we got the permit." And she was like, yeah, well, they've just modified it. And when she asked the county, they said, hey, you know, you're going to be in violation then. And I'm just like, Jesus. I said, I just did all the work. I followed your direction. I just planted the hill. So I had to pull 2,000 plants off the hill. I had to go spend a month and a half getting all that. And I'm grateful I had the contractors on site working on the road because it, it, it let me put them right back on the job. But we rushed and get them up the hill and get the get the next phase of work done and then i can put plants back out but you know that was so that was one season and then the 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 next year it's uh timber harvest plan stuff and so they hit me with these another regulatory addition that they added so the, 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 when you're in cannabis now every time you turn around there's a new regulation that's put on you and the problem is is that People try to, you know, if you talk to anybody in the mainstream, they try to give you this lecture about how that's how it is in real business. And I'm cracking up because I ran a bunch of real businesses, and I'm telling you, none of them come at you like this. 
And so you start to get tired of playing patty cake. And I'm just like, you know, it would be better for me to let the farm sit and not give the county their 20 grand than it would be for me to have to play patty cake and pay them. And so I get the THP in play, and we go forward into the season. And then the next year, they hit me with an archaeological report. Oh, Jesus. And, and, they, do, and they do all this in May. So every May is when they choose to become curious about what to change and do. And that's right when you're getting all your planting in. So they said, you have to have this archaeological report. If you don't have this report, we're going to violate you. We can come in and bait your farm, cut all your parts. And I've never had any issues, right? So, like, there's no need to have an aggressive tone because we've we've never done anything wrong. I mean, in the in the legal sense of where we are from today, you know, this last so many years, it's been just really by the book. And I just got frustrated, and I said, you know what? I said, I I, I won't plant. I said, I'll get the archaeological report, and I'm going to let the farm sit, and I'm not even going to worry about it. And it, it, it was really a nice feeling because for a minute you felt like you were in control, even though you weren't cultivating and you weren't making any money with the farm that cost you a fortune to build. You weren't also having to play the game with the county. And so it was really like I needed the break from the bullshit. And so last year um, I ended up cultivating for the cookies. So the cookie enterprises had me run a bunch of their genes and then enter them into their system as a white label. And then this year I did the same thing, but we'll co we'll co brand this year. So I ran the last two years, but I took I took a I took a year off, and, and it was really a great year to take off. It was just you just get burned out, man. And if you once you lose your love of what you're doing, you can't really grow good grass. You know, you have to really care about what you're doing. And when the when the regulatory scheme is so difficult to fight it becomes um, oppressive. It's almost like the best thing you can do is just put it down for a second and, and don't don't take it too personal and don't allow it to sour your attitude because you have to maintain your attitude because the, the positivity within you is what sustains you as you go through this unbelievably tumultuous, confusing process that no one who regulates you really understands what they're doing. And the, the system is broken. And for all of us that are cultivators, we're just basically, you know, pawns on a board. And every now and then, man, it's nice to get off the board. And so uh, I took that break, and it was it was good. But no, last two years I'm back, brother. Far, well, that's awesome, man. Hey, so out on the farm, what kind of IPM are you running? I mean, are you running biological predators? Yeah, I do, and that's really all I use. What I what I learned up the hill is that like what I really like about up being where I'm at up the hill is that I don't have any neighboring farms and so I'm in a really good position to where you you don't have a, a lot of vectors of transmission and as long as I don't go through someone's operation and then go to my operation and carry some kind of pathogen on my body we're pretty good and so I could I can get a little bit of fungal issues and I can get a little bit of windborne problems. But for the most part, not bad. And so what you what you find is that you typically, if you can start out with clean source material, your your beginning is good. And we notice that it's really around first of August that you'll start to see drips come in and russet mites, where if they're present in the area and they get moved by wind, that's when you'll see them. And so what I do is. I just inoculate the plants prophylactically with juvenile Californicus mites. And so I have a, a good relationship with a, a BioLine. So I have a rep, Sebastian from BioLine, and I just give him a call and tell him how much I need and what, what my goals are so we can kind of take a look to see, you know, what, what else is new in the world that might work best. And because I'm not really having to deal with the aphid issue this year up the hill like a lot of people are, I didn't have to go in with any kind of lace swings or stuff like that. I was just able to go with really a straight Californicus mite. And the Californicus mite works really well for me because my farm is so hot and dry. And so that hot dry makes it tough on a lot of the other biological predation to reproduce effectively. But my hill is good and the Californicus mite works well. And I just put the sachets out probably like, you know, second week of July. And so what that does, it allows the, 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 the juveniles to start crawling out of the sachets and start crawling up the plants 
and that kind of times it so that when the problems typically hit where we'll see an influx of issues, I have a good population already present. And I think a big part of IPM really is keeping your plants healthy in general. And a lot of times, um, moderately fed plants, less charged plants, seem to be less attractive. And so there's a balance of how much herb you're going to grow in terms of on the stick and how much herb you're actually going to harvest and sell. And so to me, I'd rather grow less on the stick and sell more than get more on the stick and sell less. And so I just noticed that if you, if you are normal with your feed programs and you just keep the plants healthy, you have less attraction to pathogens because you're keeping them overall, they're less sappy. The sugar's high, the bricks level's high, but they're not overloaded. And so for me, it's really pretty simple. I don't do any kind of sprays for any type of pathogens. I don't, I don't, and I've been fortunate, so I don't have to worry about um, a lot of the issues because if I start with clean source material, the farm itself is pretty secluded. And then keep them healthy and then bring in your biologicals in the time frames that you need. And then it lets you have a pretty good control. So it's not too bad. And if I see an outbreak, which a couple of years prior we had an outbreak, I just I just increase the level of adults versus juveniles. So I bring in juveniles to hatch out that that lasts about a month, and then the adults release as soon as you bring them out. And so what that does is that'll let you have a, a knockdown of the population, and then the juveniles will come and continue to cleanse and kill. And this way, you'll only lose a portion of your crop. But the russet mite population seemed to have died down a little bit. And like I said, aphids this year are big, but mostly I see the aphids in greenhouses and indoors. And I see a lot of the leaf hoppers in some operations, but I've been fortunate where they don't thrive up where I'm at. Yeah, I'm I'm real lucky to have an insectary close to me. I'm out in Ojai, um, down by Santa Barbara, and I've got an insectary real close to me that, I, yeah, I just love working with them, man. But yeah, that high heat will kill a lot. Of, uh, Rincon Vitova. Oh, yeah, Rincon Solid. I like dealing with Rincon, too. I've dealt with it before. They have some nice people there. And, um, yeah, I've dealt with a lot of insectaries. You know, Rincon's a good one, too. They, I, I like the magic beans. They have that little magic beans they sell, the kit. Yeah. That you put out. Oh, as, yeah. As, as, yeah. As, as, um, you trap, as you trap plants. Yeah, they were nice enough to give me a bunch of those bean kits when I did, a, yep. I did like, a CBD convention and just handed them out to people, and people were tripping out. They're like, really? This is all I need? I was like, trust me, man. Those green, those bean plants are fucking amazing. Mm -hmm. you, you will know? find the bugs there. Yeah. Yeah, especially caterpillars, man. Those things will just pull those caterpillars away. They're fucking great. Mm -hmm. I, I, was, I, was on a, I, was, I was having a conversation the other day with someone that was a big, big fan of red kale where red kale is exceptionally sweet and attractive. And so for any kind of aphid issue, they would plant the red kale and they would use that as their trap plant where they would, it would, it would bring the, the aphids from the cannabis to the kale and then they could then work on extermination from there. And so, you know, a lot of it is just being proactive. And the, the thing is that when you, when you create some of these, I mean, because there's some operations that are stunning, you know, some of these new mixolites are just unbelievable. But the problem is, is that they're, they're isolated internally, meaning that there's no external pressure on them to balance out what's, what's being brought in. And so you don't have a natural predation. Just like when I have, when I have like cat, not caterpillars, but, um, grasshoppers. So when I have grasshoppers, little baby locust kind of things creeping around the plants, I have a population of micro-sized birds that live in the, the, the woods around the farm. And every morning I'll come out and they will be flying through the plants, just cleaning them out. And that's just an incredible natural process, right? And so you don't do any running some of these highly technical ops. It doesn't it, it, it doesn't happen like that. So if you make any mistakes and you don't catch the problem early and it infests through a canopy that's, you know, hundred thousand, two hundred thousand square feet, I mean you're talking a catastrophic problem. So for me, you know, full outdoor operations, as long as your plants are healthy and you're you're aware of what comes in through the year time wise so that you can get everything in prep beforehand, it's just a lot easier. It it really does take down a lot of those problems, man. I mean, instead of just waiting to see, you know, uh, instead of reacting. Uh, but you don't totally. put... And, and, 
Some have to react, though, because, I mean, sometimes, you know, that you, you, you can't prepare for a problem that you don't know is going to happen. And so you have to kind of be able to, you know, run your operation in the same zone for a while. And if you can see what happens over a period of time, you can get an idea of rhythmically through the seasons what kind of issues does one expect. And the thing is that we're building new operations constantly, and people are shifting. A lot of cultivators are running something here, and then there's issues with the investment or the leadership or the management, and they go somewhere else. And so you're jumping and jumping and jumping, and it doesn't allow you to build your like baseline data of what to expect. And so you know, once you have an idea of what to expect, then you can know. That's why I know, like in our area, that right around that first of August is when you start to see thrips and russet mites uh, populating at a higher than normal level, and that's when you you know you have to make sure your predation's in place beforehand. Yeah, around here, um, about August, <clears throat> about the beginning of August, you start to see a lot of moth flight. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, that is just, those are the signs of, all right, well, that means, you know, you got to put out something because you're going to have caterpillars in your bud if not. Yeah, you guys are a little different. You're like, see, just like down in any of the grape areas. So you're down in San Luis Obispo, you're down in like Napa, uh, the coddling moth that gets into everything. We're pretty lucky here. We don't have a lot of that because we don't have a lot of grapes. So we're not having a lot of those problems because we don't have the host. It's it's fortunate. It's kind of like with hemp, you know. So even though um, it would be nice if Humboldt had a hemp industry, in addition, Humboldt kind of put hemp on the back burner because they didn't know how to put hemp out without creating problems for cannabis. And, and Humboldt's really not ideal for hemp because of the, it, the terrain. It's hemp's best if you're really doing it by a large acreage. And cannabis is what we're known for. And so Humboldt's like, hey, we're going to protect the cannabis and we're going to just push push the hemp out. And we don't have a lot of grape. We have some. We have some decent wineries in Humboldt County, but overall, a very small amount of canopy comparatively. But if you get down into the Central Valley area more, like the you know Napa, Sonoma, down in San Luis, you go down deeper um, into Paso Robles, all those areas where you have a lot of wine country now. All those areas, all the farmers around there seem to have great uh, the coddling moth problems, caterpillar problems. Hey, hey, Kevin, uh, I want to change uh, directions here with you real quick, man. So, uh, sure. so America, you know, as you know, as we've gone through time, you know, we've exported a lot of things culturally, you know, rock and roll, the blues, you know, rap music. And another one of those things that that really didn't realize how much we exported it was the cannabis culture, man. I mean, does it trip you out to see that influence when you travel around the world? You know, it, we we kind of we kind of exported the cannabis culture, but the thing is, is that you got to if you get to, if you take a look at the world, right, and you go back about fourteen thousand years, where you have your really first like recorded cannabis experiences, where people were using cannabis, like in Mongolia, Siberia. And from that point forward, up until you know hundred hundred years ago, cannabis was just absolutely accepted. And it was revered, and it was it was beneficial, and it was positive. And then and then and then hemp becomes a problem to some of the wealthy um, industrialists, and they use their connections, and they ban cannabis, which subsequently lets them ban hemp. And all of a sudden, you know, the whole world goes into this lockdown on cannabis, and then the U.S., which is this major consumer of cannabis, becomes, becomes its own internal producer. And we actually end up producing some ungodly good cannabis because the places that people settled in to, to get away from the man and grow it turned out to be unbelievable locations to grow dope. So what's happening to me is that you're, you're, you're going back to a normalcy. And so the U.S. always brings the, you know, like this hype because we have Hollywood. And so we have this, you know, this machine that creates perspective. But everywhere you go, the, the people, were consuming before we were there's there's no location on earth that 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 if it was any place that was a cannabis region they were able to puff in a long time before us because the u.s you know cannabis came over uh, so many hundreds of years ago in small form and mostly through all the slaves that were being brought into the country and it, it it's uh things that they took with them because it was important to them it was part of their culture and so I think that what you're seeing is that, you know, the, the, the cannabis culture is being remagnified 
and all these other regions in the world are able to showcase, hey, look, where where cannabis regions do. It's just the U.S. is where the product really makes the money and gets sold. And the U.S. has always been so good at creating, you know, visual hype. So we, we, we I, I want to say, um, not legitimatize, but we, we stamp cre- a credo on things. We make it seem like this is legit. And what's awesome is that you're having cannabis be, be recognized as phenomenal across the world. And that's what I really like because when I go to the other countries that I do work and stuff, you know, you, they're, if it's Arabic countries or Israeli, you know, the region, they're, um, absolutely deep into cannabis for thousands of years. And if you go to Colombia, Mexico, any of the Americas, same thing, man, it's, you know, a huge swath of time things have been present. And so for us, we're able to, to legitimatize it because the U.S. was the ones who really controlled the drug war. We're the ones that started the drug war, and we really forced it upon a lot of other nations as a as a code of how they could behave. And if they didn't, we would be trade with them. And so now that we're kind of you know taking the chains off of that, it's allowing it all to flourish. But I really think that it's it's a it's a development you know unilaterally among all these regions where cannabis culture from America is now cannabis culture in Asia, cannabis culture in South America. It's just now cannabis culture again, and I love it. I just love that part because, you know, for 14,000 years, cannabis is, is accepted and then instantly taken out, and now it's, you know, coming back into vogue, and the world the world needs the plant. You know, it's been too valuable. It, it was with us through our existence, and all of a sudden, uh, now it's recognized as being legitimate once again. So finally, you can have that connection to where people from all over the world can find something common. Yeah, it's it's almost like a universal language um, as far as like, you know, mm-hmm. you, you may not be able to communicate with somebody else when you're in another country, but as soon as you make a sign for, hey, let's smoke a joint, you know, people who are hip, they're hip, man. They're like, yeah, let's go do it. Here's how we do it. For real. It's, and it's beautiful because it's it's the, it's, it's the part about being human. You know, the when there's enough, people typically don't fight it out. You know, you don't you don't go to war with someone. Unless you're a nut, but um, um, there's enough. If there's enough food and water, you typically don't go to war with somebody. So when there's when there's enough stuff, people people can behave really pretty well. And cannabis is one of those things. I think that when you consume it, it just brings out some of the nicest parts of us. It it brings out a really peaceful, gentle side of the human being, and that's a wonderful thing to have happen. So this way, what it does is it allows people to see each other as human beings and. For a brief moment, you're the same, and that's what I think people have to realize is that you know you're a human being. There, there's there's many there's many like uh, variations of the human, but there's only one human, and it makes it be easy to get along with humans in general. We have cultural mores, we have uh, peculiarities, specificities depending on our regions we grew up in and what was what was allowed and not allowed but the fundamental stuff of um, be nice to each other everybody has to have food shelter and clothing and Canada seems to uh, make a big difference in how people interrelate uh, just shines you know so it's, it's killer right now and as soon as they get rid of some of these drug conventions where the you know you start to have the UN remove some of this language and start to open these doors up and It'll, it'll just be wonderful because so much of the uh, prison population is really nonviolent drug offenders. And it, it's just, it was a money making racket, and, and it still is. And it just needs to stop. Well, it's also like a big form of control, man. Uh, um, oh, yeah. Well, you huge. know, because it, just, it, just it, taking it, it on the, just, just taking it on the sense of how cannabis makes you feel. I don't know if the powers that be really want everybody to feel happy and get along, because then that means well. Oh God, no! Divisiveness is crucial. You have to divide. If you if you can divide, you can conquer. Once once people start to see each other as as the same, and that you're all equally valuable, and that you're all equally replaceable, you you start to see each other on a little bit more normal level, and for political groups and 
people that are obsessed with power, that is not what they need. They need to have their people, not all people, their people. And th- there's a problem with that in that you're, you're creating a, a division for your own gain, not one for the gain of the individuals themselves. So the people aren't benefiting, but the people who are controlling the, the system are. And they're, they're benefiting quite clearly. I and mean, if, I mean, if you want to see some benefit, I mean, Bezos just broke, and, well, you know, from Amazon, he just broke $200 billion today, right? So he he's jumped up like eighty billion over the, over this COVID crisis. Well, yeah, because everyone's and all, all the billionaires have jumped up some ungodly amount of money from the COVID crisis. But the regular population of America has been decimated, and so they didn't make money as much as they transferred money. So money was transferred from those that used to have something to those that have all. If if COVID. Um, is such an issue, then you can only be allowed to buy the product from Amazon or Target or Walmart. But if it's a small individual, you can't buy it from them because COVID might exist in their, their situation. And so what you've seen is this incredible transfer of wealth, which just blows my mind, how much money is being generated by the billionaires and how much money is being lost by the regular people. So it it's fucking mind bending. You know, you can't you can't have that much. Nobody can make eighty billion in in a couple of months. I don't give. I don't care how smart you are. That there is no way that much money can be generated in that form and at this level. So I mean, it, it's just so mind bending to me. So I, I look at all this stuff as just uh, man, you're you're. You're living in a crazy time, and thank God there's some good herb to smoke. Because otherwise, you know, you lose your mind. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's no clarity in sight, man. There's, nobody's got a plan other than break you down financially so that you're vulnerable. Yeah, yeah, and that's uh, and that's the thing, dude, about the quarantine, right? Like you were saying, I mean, if Bezos made eighty million during the quarantine, that's because everybody was forced to live online. You had to buy everything mm-hmm. online, dude. You know, everything was closed, like you were saying. So I'm. That and you had to use your credit card. So again, there goes other fucking rich. Anyways, man. So yeah, yeah, because they're taking points for the use of the card. So you know, no matter what you do, you're getting peeled. So you're having to spend more and more money in order to 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 live, and it, it gets to a point where you're basically. It's kind of like the old days when you went to work for a company and they had you live in the, the company village. And you had to buy all your stuff at the company store. And by the end of, you know, payday, you'd get your paycheck and you'd, you'd go and spend your money and you'd find yourself, you know, two days short of supplies and food. So by Wednesday of next week, you're short money. And so you'd, you'd have less for two days. You'd have to take a loan and for, eventually you become fully in debt to the company because you're living in their houses and you're buying from their stores. And the rents are artificially high, and the the food and the products from the stores are artificially high, but they make it to where if you're not working for the company, you're not having any business. And so it just creates this this uh, financial slavery that's just savage. Well, and I'm... I just I see that I see that now, and, and I'm just like, wow. I mean, I'm in my mid fifties, you know. So I've watched America change so dramatically over my lifetime from a place that used to have a tremendous manufacturing capacity, which allowed many people to have jobs that otherwise um, they don't today. We subbed all that work out and we, we wanted, you know, instead of buying one pair of sneakers a year that you paid a hundred dollars for, we want to buy five pairs that you pay $20 for. So you're, you're still paying a hundred bucks a year in sneakers. You're just getting five pairs instead of one, but they wear out five times faster. And the people that make those sneakers in Bangladesh and all these other countries are getting paid one fifth of what the workers in America were paid. But the companies that are generating the the product that are selling it are making incredible profits. But the people in Bangladesh are getting screwed. At least, I mean, at least they have some work. But I mean, they're pay, getting paid at a rate of pay that's just mind-bendingly low. And the Americans don't have jobs at all. We went into a full service sector. So if you're not in, in a, some specific fields in the U.S., you're very limited as to what you can do. And so they put you into very low-paying service jobs. 
and that's not enough to take care of yourself. You can't, you can't if you're if you're working at any of these jobs on a minimum wage anywhere in the U.S., you can't afford to live on your own. It's almost impossible to be like mathematically to actually survive. So it, it's a it's a strange situation, man. And and Herb has always been this incredible safety net to where for a lot of people they could grow a little side pot and you know sell a little bit of grass and augment the income. And people get, you know, very mad about that because they're like, you know, the argument was always, I pay my taxes. But the reality is, is that the, having a neighbor who's able to keep their home and afford to, to take care of their kids and afford to be able to kind of be normal, I would rather have that happening than worry about if they're paying every one of their taxes so the government can take that money and do what they choose with it. It, it's really about, is it more important to feed the government or is it more important to feed the people? I think cannabis is the way out, man. You know, fucking legalize cannabis the whole way and let's uh, get people to work. At least that way industry's created. Well, well there can only be so much that you can smoke, though. That you're going to reach a point where, like, there's only so much smokable herb that can be created. And they, they have to figure out how to utilize the new hemp industry as a construction product. And they really haven't done the R and D on it. But like the problem with hemp herb is that you can't, you know, like you can use hempcrete. People love hempcrete, and I think it's phenomenal too. But it's got an unbelievably low compressive strength compared to concrete. So the problem is that you have to put a reinforced structure inside it, and then you can use it. So it, it it's not as simple as replacing cement with hempcrete because one of them has an ungodly compressive strength, which means you can stack weight on top of it, and hemp doesn't. So it's really about, you know, de developing new engineering programs and getting young kids to look at the products and to figure out, you know, alternative forms of how do we use it correctly and how many different ways can it be used in today's society to fit the needs. And then what you start having is, you know, uh, construction industries. And then you start having the same thing occur with um, hemp derivatives in all forms, and that's biochemistry. That's other industries. The consumable cannabis, you know, it, 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 the, the problem with that is that you, you're going to have to, you're going to have to go head to toe with the pharmaceutical industry because so much of what cannabis is used for is to feel better. And if I can feel better, that means I don't have to take all these other drugs that big pharma just kind of crams down your throat to the medical system. So, you know, it's really about, I think, taking the cannabis plant and stepping back from it and really taking a look and figuring out how do you utilize such an unbelievably complex bioreactor? You can get so much from it. What is it that we can get? How do we begin to use it? And how do you really start to develop new industries from it? And the problem is that that's not quick because it's going to be a direct competitor existing industries and industry spends money you know, to, to develop their future. They don't want to have to suddenly stop doing what they're doing and then flip and become a new, a new industry. That's not economically efficient for them. So they're going to fight it. And that's where you see a lot of these struggles. And that was the same struggle that outlawed cannabis was. You had, you know, DuPont had just come out with nylon. He does not want uh, hemp products to compete. Rockefeller controls the oil industry. He doesn't want hemp products to compete. Hearst is the largest timber holder in the world. He he uses it for uh, you know for his newspapers, but also his timber. And the last thing that he wants is an alternative product that people can grow um, and compete with him. And so these massive industrial conglomerate groups band together to ban this product because it it competes with them financially. And so it's impossible for us to use cannabis in this intelligent way when there's so much industry already built that. They'd have to go and clean it out and start again, and they don't want to do that. And so the idea of you know making a simple transition is, is a lot harder, I think, than just that. But the, the part that is, is huge for us is that first the public is starting to really believe it. The public starts to realize that cannabis has been um, maligned and that hemp is this incredible product that can be used for all these alternative products at a better price and less uh, ecological damage 
And so once you get the public to be able to believe, now you can start to, to have these conversations. But they did such a good job for so long making the public think that everything involved in cannabis was a sham, that hemp was a sham and cannabis itself was a sham, that no matter what you did, you couldn't get anybody to agree with you. All they wanted to set, tell you was that uh, you just want to go smoke pot and go hang out and not pay your taxes. And the reality of it is is that down deep, that's what most people really like to do in life is, is smoke a little grass and hang out with their friends and not have the government take all their money. And so I don't, I don't see where that's a bad thing, you know? But hey, Kevin, let me take you back real quick to competition, man, because like earlier this year, you know, I mostly want to talk about the Colombian scare. Colombia came out with a number that said that they were able to produce, a, I think, a gram of cannabis for like 58 cents. And, you know, like, you know, everybody like in Canada and everywhere here in America, they were like, there's no way. How are we going to compete with 58 cents grams of cannabis? Uh, but it's really not that easy to grow good weed down in places that equatorial, that close to the equator, is it? Well, you know, it, it's, you can grow really good grass in a lot of places in the world. It's just that when it comes to what we define as good, is it good because the chemotype is right? Or is it good because it has a, a morphologically attractive appearance? And so much of cannabis is, is driven from the way it looks because we purchase it in that form. So straight flour is the toughest product to sell because it, you can see what it looks like. And so, I mean, there's massive operations in every country that can't sell any flour because the flour is so bunk, they have to turn it into concentrate of some sort. They have to, they have to derive it. And that way you can scrub all your mistakes away, kind of like pre-rolls. Pre-rolls let you hide your mistakes. Uh. Derivatives let you hide your mistakes. <laughs> flour doesn't. And the thing is that when you have those low prices in those other countries, you also have to deal with the fact that in order for them to get it to us, they're going to have to ship it, and then they're going to have to get it through uh, regulatory, and then they're going to have to get it through the taxes and tariffs because there's no way the U.S. is going to allow you just to flood the market and take away the tax base from the U.S. And so even though it might be cheap, you know, like, I mean, I'll give you a good example. You know, a, a gram of cocaine is a dollar in, in Colombia. Right, so um, it's it's not a dollar in America. No. So by the time you get it here, it's increased by a hundred hundred times. So you're you're at a radically, especially if it's with it's the same cocaine, right? So that's a product that's also made in other countries, and it's very cheap. Um, poppy, uh, you know, opium base is very cheap in Asia, but uh, by the time you get it to America, it's not. And so it, it's one thing to be able to cheaply produce something in another place. It's a whole other story to get it into the U.S. and then try to sell it. And so the U.S. has its own domestic industry that's pretty strong. And the regulatory costs are, are needed by the government because it allows them to extract the maximum amount of dollars. And I don't see them suddenly allowing cheap product to flood the system and lose on their tax revenue. So if, if this wasn't so heavily taxed, I'd look at the industry differently and I'd say, hey, you know, some of these cheaper products are going to come over and they're going to disrupt the industry. What What's going to happen is those, those products are going to disrupt bulk derivative markets because when you can produce, you know, 20,000 acres of product and turn it into a concentrate and then you can get your, your – uh, export set up and you can do the numbers and you find out that you can beat the price by a little bit hey you have a competitive product but when it comes to the flour it's very difficult i think to go at it from an intelligent point of view now some countries are doing export like uruguay i, I think um portugal portugal just shipped in cannabis to israel so the israelis just uh because they, they're a little short their their production system isn't set up enough to fill the needs at this point and when that happens i don't think they'll have to export but i just i just saw a video of the first cannabis being shipped into israel from portugal and i think that's an excellent thing that you can get cannabis for the for the individuals who need it from other countries i i'm not against um, products moving across borders at all i think it's huge i just don't think that for the u.s consumer 
they're so inclined to want anything other than what they've been conditioned to get, which is some really, really good looking grass. So the, the U S the, the, the U S really puts uh, an emphasis on two things. You know, they, they emphasis on, is this stuff look good so I can show it off? And it does the num are the numbers the same? And that's not so easy to create everywhere yet. We're not into that world yet. Once we really start to dial in our genomics, once we start to really get plants that can give us what we want in environments that aren't optimal for that appearance, then you'll see some changes. But in the meantime, I think we're all right. You know, and I think that really when you get right down to it, it's the U.S. that's going to export some killer grass, that the California market, when we start to move out, herb out of California, when you start moving it up out of uh, southern Oregon and you start getting some of that good grass out of Michigan and some of the craft pot out of New England areas where there's micro pockets where the pot is really exceptional. It just is. And they'll be able to export that in small quantities to places around the world that want to pay a premium for things that are unique. But on the large scale, you know, as soon as the Midwest is done screwing around with commoditized corn, um, the rest of the world has to be afraid because the U.S. Ha approaches ag from a radically different perspective. And once we start farming hemp by the million acre and you have, you know, combines that can, that can throw a ton, ton every 10 seconds into a, into a shredder, we have a problem. And, and that's coming. That's what's next. So I think that a lot of the fear we have is, is, is just being placed so that people always, they want you to be afraid. Fear is crucial. You know, you have to have a fear index, otherwise people feel comfortable. And if you feel comfortable, you'll you'll relax and you'll make better decisions. But if I can make you afraid, I can get you to panic. And when you panic, you make bad decisions. And so for cannabis farmers, I think the best thing they can do is just focus on trying to be a good farmer. Grow the best you can. Grow the canopy size that you can sell. Work on developing good methodologies that work at your location. Uh, work on building brand value as you can slowly get your name out but make sure you're succeeding while that's happening and we can compete hey kevin so i've heard you talk on youtube a couple of different times about some of the differences between the weed that's grown naturally and then weed that's grown with like bottled newt with salts uh, is there a way to tell like just by looking at it whether it's been grown differently whether it's salts or naturally you know not so much from visual um, you know, because some salt-grown herb is some of the best-looking grass you've ever seen, it, as long as you can keep the plant protected. The problem with salt-grown salt, salt grown products typically is that you're not having enough cross-concentration, meaning you're not having enough of all the small cofactors that are present in a biological delivery. So if I can run a plant with 14 elements, right, and get a full product, versus I'm running it with some type of organic methodology where I might have over 80 different minerals in the clay component alone. All of those things, I think, combine and they, they create a sink that the plant can pull from when it needs assistance. It allows the plant to be able to develop a healthier, stronger plant. But, you know, some of the, or most of the herb coming out of the indoors in, in California is all salt grown. And I mean, it's some of the best looking grass you've ever seen in your life because they have it in, in a perfect environment where your, your humidity is ideal the entire time. So the plant's always transpiring and you're drying it out at the end uh, to make it struggle a little bit and trike out even more. You're using incredibly uh, sophisticated lighting. The nutrients that you're using have been really dialed in. Everything's basically a Hoagland formula. So Hoagland formula is the original formula where they figured out or that uh, Liebling was the one that figured out, you know, what the plants needed. Hoagland was the one who took that information and made it into a, into a nutrient formulation. So almost all your nutrient formulations are all basically modified Hoagland formulas. And it, the, the, plant, the plant will do what it needs to do with limited amounts. So environment, lighting, and nutrition, and you can get some stuff that's supernatural looking. And it looks the same as, as biologically grown, You'll see way heavier yields indoor, and you potentially have even heavier yield outdoor if you, everything's buffered. What you, what you see the difference in primarily is in shelf life and in exhale. 
And so what I've seen is that, you know, biologically driven cannabis has a far greater shelf life. The, the, the plant creates different bioprotections utilizing all that material, and it holds on the shelf better. And so chemically grown grass, it, it breaks down quicker. It just does. I mean, it, it, there's a lot of opinions on things, but, like, when you own a store and you're moving a lot of grass through your hands for a long time, there's just the fact that stuff grown with salt does not last as long as stuff grown biologically. So if the flower is moving through the system at a fast rate of speed, you don't have to worry about degradation in the jar. But if it has to sit at any, any point along the way, biograss holds up better. And there's flavonoids that are produced in response to all this chemical activity that I don't think you get from salt grown. So even if it's indoor bio versus indoor salt grown, the indoor bio to me always has a better flavor. Now it's thicker, it's richer. Some people don't like a thicker, richer flavor. They like a more mild, lighter flavor. So it's not to say one's wrong or one's right, but it's that if you're really a heavy consumer of cannabis, I would say, you know, you, for all of us that have been career, you know, consumers, we kind of go, look, you know, good bio cannabis is phenomenal. And the way they get around some of it is you're running chemical systems and then you're putting some kind of compost tea mix in it to increase some of that flavonoid profile. So you're kind of tricking the plant. We used to use sugars to where you would use sugars to wash through so it would help mask some of the petroleum taste. At, at the exhale, when you blow out the exhale at the very end of it, there's something left that isn't what you want. And to me, that was always from chemical ag. So visually, it's difficult. And even nowadays with with selection, it used to be outdoor had you know a, a different structure than indoor because of the lighting. But, you know, we've done a really good job with selection on choosing things that, that look indoor-outdoor. And so you can find varieties that just shine outside, that tighten up, that have a very common appearance, so that when you put it in the bag, the user goes, ooh, that looks just like what I'm used to smoking, but it was grown outside. If it looks too different in appearance, it makes people get nervous and they don't want to try it because people don't like variety as much as they tell you they do. If you, if you look at someone's menu through the year, it doesn't vary too much. Take a look at their clothes over a couple year period. They don't vary too much. Your habits don't vary that much. People are pretty the same as much as they think that they're radically unique in what they do all the time. And so when cannabis doesn't fit a profile, it makes people nervous. And so we've done this really good job of hunting and selecting varieties that shine in sunlight situations that make you think that it is grown under electric light. And the only difference really is, is I think, the, w the way that you can really tell is in burnability, where the one thing I've noticed with indoor and outdoor is that almost all outdoor, especially bio-outdoor, it has a higher level of lipid. The wax levels are higher. And so when you light up a joint that was grown outside in the sun under biological delivery, the joint stays lit a lot longer. So you can light the joint. I can put the joint down on the deck. I can go out in my yard, unhook my dog, bring my dog back in the house, pick up the joint off the, off the deck, and puff it, and it blows right back into flame. If that was indoor, I'd have to use a lighter to relight it because I don't have the same levels of wax. The, the outdoor creates that, and biologically, it enhances it. And so there's a few things that you can kind of pick up, and there's definitely some flavor profiles that you just can't really get around. But man, you know, the whole, the whole market all these years for all of us outdoor, uh, you know, sun depth guys was to fool people into thinking that it was indoor because that's where the higher price point was. So it was really about trying to figure out, you know, how do you make that happen? How do you find the right cultivars that appear indoor morphologically? You know, they have that popped look feel to them. So that tightening of the bud isn't just adding, you know, some natural PGRs like some tricantinol or... But it's also your cultivar you know, choice. PGR. The problem with PGRs is that you know the, everybody was all caught up in that shit, and those were all things that that we used to use way back in the day for um, for chrysanthemums and stuff like that. It's all for for flower for commercial floriculture, right? Which isn't a big deal because you're not consuming it. But any of those things are toxins. And so the first time I ever experienced PGRs in cannabis was forever ago, and. I didn't like the flavor. It just, it, it was not the same grass, man. 
you got a heavier bud and you got more weight and you got a chunky nugget, but it didn't have any of the flavor and it just didn't have the same shine. There's a trade. There's only, there's only, you, you can only get so much of so much. And so when you're really trying to, to make something happen, the, the best thing you can do is try to understand what is it the market wants. And when they, when they, when they have a, a desire, now your, your mission as the cultivator is to find something that fits that desire. And that just means you go hunt and you go hunt through populations of plants and you find the outliers that have a natural tightness that don't open up in foxtail. If those things that, that do that, then you, you can't sell them commercially. And it doesn't mean that it's not unbelievable cannabis. It doesn't mean it's not some of the best cannabis you might have ever smoked in your life. It just means that the market doesn't want to accept it as that. And so there's always the truth of a sale where the person with the money dictates the truth. They either buy it or they don't. And I think that for a lot of people, you know, they got caught up on PGR grass because it was um, a less potent in general to buy in, 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 in terms of access. And so you could grow more to make more, but you could sell less quality. Where right now, I think the quality market is way up, where I think people's, people's expectations of grass is way up. And that's why they get pissed off with the, the, the storefronts, because the storefronts, the, the supply chain is so jacked up that by the time, you know, Herb makes it to the store, it might be 10, 11 months old sometimes. And so, you know, the it, and that wouldn't be a big deal if it was held in some kind of refrigerated form and no oxidization. But you know, a lot of these, you know, distributors and processors and manufacturers, when they get the grass, they were just holding it in basically, you know, garages. And it was just, just destroying the pot. And by the time the pot makes it to the end user, it's swag. And so the brand takes a beating, the store looks stupid, the, the, the system is broken, and really it's the fact that the regulatory system is broken and it doesn't allow any kind of expediency through the supply chain. And so people are like, you know, where's the good grass that used to be present? And I think that for a lot of people, you know, once they become aware of what good pot is, it, if you, you buy a bag of PGR grass, you're like, that is some bland shit. So I'm glad that it was a little cheaper, and I'm glad that it was a, a, a chunkier nugget. But I got way less quality of experience with it, and so maybe it's worth me paying five bucks more and getting you know, a, a radically different level of enjoyment. And so money's a huge factor in the buy, but if I spend too little, I don't get any satisfaction. So that's actually wasted money. So like there's a sweet spot in purchase an herb of I spent the right amount and got the right amount of quality experience. And I think that the the, the days of the PGR grass are kind of they're they're going out the tubes. And good and good genomic selection is 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 happening to where you're getting plants that produce better and are more resistant so you can get a heavier, chunkier product. So that's good for the for the for the farmer. And as long as you're not losing quality, then it's great for the customer. Hey, so you being a, a shop owner, what is that that basic price then? That sweet spot for for price and flavor. What do you what would you say that is? You know, in California, I would say that's around forty bucks. That 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 in in a in a in a in a, in California because California has got a high regulatory cost, so it's almost impossible to get below that. But if you if around forty bucks, where if it's if it's if you can deliver something of quality at 40 and 8 legally, you're in a good position. Some of the top shelf shit's going for probably like 80. So some of the some of the cookie varieties are going for 80. And a lot of that is they have some unique varieties and, and they, they are pretty fire. But they also have excellent branding. And so it, to me, it's kind of like comparing a Corvette to a Ferrari where in a lot of ways the Corvette outhandles the Ferrari, out accelerates the Ferrari has some um, better features than the Ferrari, but definitely does not have the same brand value. And so Ferrari command a couple times the price and people pay it because of the perception. But all things considered, if you just look at the numbers on the board, they're not much different. And that's how it kind of goes with a lot of stuff in life. But to me, like 40 bucks where if, if you can get it, that, that's the range. When I go into a dispensary, that's what I ask for. I said, What's in the $40 price range that's killer? Where are people seeming to be happy? 
because I don't, I don't want to ask a dispensary, hey, what's your best shit? Because they're always going to throw me what's the most expensive shit. And that doesn't mean best. That just means most expensive. And so I always ask the person who's doing the selling, you know, and this is good advice for anybody, you ask them, what's moving? What seems to be moving briskly through your store? What are people buying multiple times? Where are you getting your best feedback? And then they give you a couple different varieties that they've seen have really good sales. And then that kind of gives you an idea of uh, what, what's, what's popping. And then you can try some of those things just to see, hey, is it, is, why is it moving? Is it good? Is it a good batch? But I always look for that $40 price range in California. In Oregon, it's a lot cheaper because Oregon has less regulatory costs. So Oregon, you have uh, some of the best, cheapest grass. But in California, you know, for, for a regulated bag, 40 bucks is, is uh, if you can get it in at 40 you're going to get regular people who want to buy it, so you'll be able to sell a lot of it. And if you can give them some decent grass, they're going to want to come back and buy more of it. And then if you're somebody who's fortunate enough to build an incredible brand like Ferrari, like Cookie, then you can throw 78, 80 bucks on an eighth and move that stuff out the door like it's flying on a plane. Wow, Kevin, man. That's uh, that's some great advice, man. Thanks, brother. Appreciate that. Uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to get on coming on the show, man. Uh, that was tremendous. Oh, no, it's brother. my pleasure, man. You know? It's my pleasure. Uh, you know, it, it, it's it's always good to share your perspective, and it's always it's always good to be able to connect with new people who are putting um, perspective out. And that way what it does is it, it allows the individuals who listen to these things to be able to get some information, and then it always lets me connect with new people, and and then I get to see who, who's been on the cast prior and, and then post, and it lets you kind of get a feel for the, the, the podcast host and what's going on because it lets you be alive in the culture. And I think that that's part of the price you have to pay if you become well-known is that you have to make sure that you're available to you know answer a question or, or take the time to, to be public. And you're not trying to sell your products while you're there. What you're trying to do is you're just trying to answer questions honestly so that if there's any value that can be derived by the listeners, then they get it. And and what that does is that's a a, a nice way of, of sharing. And cannabis was always good to me. You know, she's been good to me my whole life. And without her, I wouldn't have the life I had. And so I always want to make sure that other people can share and enjoy that too. Because I don't see you as a competitor. You're you're just somebody who's a co-conspirator in the cannabis world, and it's more of us than just me and against you. And so it, it's a uh, it's always an honor to be asked to be on a, on a, on anybody's show and that's trying to do legitimate work. So thank you so much for taking the time to ask me to be on your show. Absolutely, brother. Anytime, man. And uh, brothers and sisters, uh, actually do yourselves a favor if you don't know if you've never heard of Kevin Jodry, which. Yeah, do yourself a favor and go find out who he is and what he does and listen to him. He's got plenty of YouTube videos out there, man. Uh, Kevin, uh, do me a favor. Don't hang up. Everybody else, I'm going to play a little bit of music and then I'll be right back. Well, there you go, everybody. That was Kevin Jodry. Um, once again, I want to thank you for taking the time to come on the show. That was uh, really awesome of him. I'm, I'm totally stoked and just I love listening to what that guy's got to say. Now, as always, if you have a question or a comment about this episode, you can send me an email that is in my grow at gmail.com. Or you can find us on social media that is at in my grow show. Now I want to thank my buddy Rodney Medina for helping me get that interview with Kevin Jodry. I, I truly do appreciate that, brother. Thank you very much. And you can find Rodney at Rodney Media. Now, just as a reminder, if you are a cannabis company, the best and most inexpensive way to keep in touch with your fans and to keep in touch with the general public, you know, just let them know what you've got going on, what new services or products you've got. Best way to do that is to advertise on the In My Grow Show. So send us an email, inmygrow at gmail.com. And we can absolutely figure out the best way to do that for you. Well, brothers and sisters, check it out. That is it. That's all I've got to share with you today. Now, I want to thank all of the artists who let me use their music to put the show together. 
And as always, mis amigos, my friends, don't forget to leave a rating and a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, go over to InMyGrow.com, subscribe to the website, and then go over to YouTube, look for the In My Grow Show with Alex, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. And after you do all that subscribing, do me one more favor. Just tell three other people about the show. Really simple, really easy. Well, brothers and sisters, I'm going to go ahead and get on out of here. You know that I love you all very much. And remember to always grow, learn, and teach. Teach.